The killer whale, Orsinus orca, is the apex predator of Earth's oceans today. Their dominion of the sea is uncontested, and they are found throughout the marine habitats of the world. As their distribution and success is absolute, it may come as a surprise to hear that this dominion was a very recent development. In the Pliocene, the genus Orsinus was quite small, conventional by many dolphin standards. Recent studies of their teeth show that they were restricted to a diet of large fish and cephalopods, prey that doesn't wear on their teeth. Although modern orcas are famous for hunting marine mammals, earning them the title Killer Whale, they appear to have been a recent adaptation within the past two or three million years, and maybe as recent as the last ice ages towards the end of the Pleistocene, when depleted fish stocks from changing currents and upwells forced them to explore other diets. This could be the reason that orcas eating foods divergent from their ancestral diets, like hard-scaled herring, open ocean sharks, and marine mammals, are so prone to teeth wear. They simply haven't been doing it long enough to develop a more robust cementum or enamel needed to tackle what they're eating. Orcas that still specialize in large fish like salmon show little to no tooth wear. An early theory is that orcas got large in order to hunt larger prey, but it seems to have been the other way around. Orcas reached large sizes first, and then increased size enabled them to specialize in bigger prey like sharks, seals, and other dolphins when fish was not readily available. It must be said that this is all recent research. I've linked them below so you can read on your own to verify, and future studies may support the old interpretation, new theories, or new ideas entirely, so take all of that as one amateur's interpretation. Orsinus first came to Chimera during the Pleistocene off the coast of Southeast Asia. There were two species, one large and one small. Both were focused on eating large fish, although this niche was highly competitive in the known world, with elasmosaurs, sharks, and small mosasaurs all vying for the same stock, which was only seasonally abundant with currents bringing cold water and a smorgasbord of polar fish every winter. Both species of Orsinus were already predisposed to be adaptable on their diet, becoming quickly versatile in response to competition as orcas did in Earth's ice ages. This smaller species became the sea wolves, roving in large packs, often hunting the smaller dolphins that mosasaurs and elasmosaurs were generally too slow to catch, while also hunting the occasional seal. The larger species of Pleistocene Orsinus was smaller in size compared to modern orcas, and was indeed closer related to orcas than the other Orsinus they shared the Pleistocene seas with, but had fewer and proportionally larger teeth, making them much better suited to tackle large game like the sloths and sirenians of the inland sea, although their dark coloration didn't serve them too well in the shallow seas, and they tended to be more successful in the deeper zones scattered throughout. Chimera experienced an arid period nearly a million years ago, and the sea levels of the inland sea were reduced. Most of the smaller sea wolves remained in the tropical and temperate waters, but the lower sea levels prompted a number of the larger orsonists to leave, traveling south to the polar sea where the large fish, marine mammals, and other prey they now preferred was in greater abundance. Those that remained were isolated to small populations in the deeper zone of the inland sea. Many of those populations went extinct. Those that went south found much more success. Their niche may have had minimal competition in the inland sea, but in the southern oceans, two predators were already specialized in marine mammals and large fish. The grandfather whale Burdu and the elasmosaur Xanatel. The large Orsinus integrated into this cast as adaptable generalists, relying on their intelligence to be competitive in the ecosystem, with different pods tending to specialize, but the species as a whole occupying a wide range of niches. This partitioning within these species has enabled several pods to occupy the same waters, and those pods are known to respond to distress talls of the other groups, another benefit when sharing waters with large and better armed predators. Orsinus orca was brought to Chimere in the same harvest that brought humans, leopards, and hippos, and like those animals, they rapidly established themselves as competitive generalists, a niche they continue to occupy to modern times, using their high intelligence and complex social coordination to compete for fish. During the winter, they will join other predators in targeting the abundant fish like large salmon, but throughout the rest of the year, the inland sea has seen many turn to hunting marine mammals, 
doing so to supplement their ancestral preference for fish, much like what happened on Earth. They outcompeted the larger Orsonists still in the inland sea, but were also restricted to the deeper zones, and didn't handle the high temperatures of the inland sea terribly well either. In modern Chimere, these three species of Orsonists have carved out different zones, but all converge in the southern channels of the inland sea during times of plenty. The Critten, or common blackfish, dolphin hunter, and sea wolf, is a highly abundant and successful predator. They are extremely fast, torpedoing through the water after small dolphins. They are dolphin specialists working in large groups to corral their prey and bring them down. Kryn live in complex fission-fusion social groups, mostly hunting in small pods of related females and their young, but keeping in contact with and assembling in massive clans of over a hundred animals to gang up on or cooperate to take down huge gatherings of other dolphins, and sometimes hunting larger game like orcas, beaked whales, or small sperm whales. Orcas are called gakrin in the common tongue, meaning giant blackfish. Most are fish specialists, but some target marine mammals in shallow waters or sharks in the open ocean. Unlike orcas of Earth, they are not apex predators, and are themselves prey to Megalodon, Xenatel, and the colossal Mosasaur Motomazor, in addition to Kurujaku in the Inland Sea. Although the Inland Sea offers sanctuary from oceanic predators, the waters are shallow enough that orcas sometimes struggle with being spotted before they can properly ambush their prey. When hunting for seals, young sloths, and walruses, orcas are known to strand themselves, something that these prey animals only have to face with the occasional kurajaku. They have populated the polar sea, but are quite rare compared to their polar specialized cousins, and are relegated to hunting fish in these waters. Like orcas of Earth, Gakrin live in pods of related females and their young, led by an elder female and defended by one or more of her sons. As they are prey species of Motomazor, Megalodon, Elasmosaurs, and Macroraptorial sperm whales, it is very important to have a few large sons in the pod, and this rank of pod defender is extremely important to Chimeran orcas. The polar blackfish, or Mokrin, may be smaller than orcas, but with an outsized skull and teeth, they are the bruisers of the dolphin world. To top it off, they are highly intelligent animals, being prone to extreme adaptability and inventiveness in seeking out prey, often targeting complex or stimulating game for the sake of the challenge. Although the full extent of their intelligence is not quantified, the Akanuk say they are the most intelligent of cetaceans, even smarter than orcas, although this reputation may be misrepresented by their higher social complexity, and the actual intelligence is likely on par with that of orcas. There are many stories of them using tools, however, and several artifacts and pieces of artwork seem to suggest a relationship with some ancient culture that made harnesses and lances for them, although this may simply be mythical accounts, or an embellished story or two of Mokrin who found spears or other weapons that they salvaged from sunken ships. Mokrin live in identical social structures to orcas, with an elder matriarch leading the pod and her eldest sons defending them. Their rival with Xenatel is legendary. Mokrin are smaller than these elasmosaurs, around half the size, but they have much higher intelligence coupled with a larger social network, meaning that they can usually hold their own and even dominate in some instances. Xenatel are intelligent for their kind and do live in complex social groups of their own, so Mokrin must often rely on coalitions of their pods for safety. There are instances of truces between the two species, especially when Mokrin target large fish and Xanatel specialize in pinnipeds, but they directly overlap in niche, so their conflicts spike any time there is a drop in prey availability. Xanatel do hunt Mokrin, which has resulted in many retaliation attacks that escalate to wider conflicts. For millions of years, the Xanatel has complete dominion of this niche, only deferring to the grandfather whale for the larger game of their menu. Now they have to share a niche with the Mokrin for half a million years, and although Xanatel have the advantage in single combat, and are generally considered the top of the niche, the fact that Mokrin now outnumber them shows promise for the future of this polar blackfish. Hybrids between Mokrin and orcas are not unheard of, 
but these unions do not produce fertile offspring. They are most common with a Mokrin mother and an Orca father, as the imposing size of male Orcas is attractive to female Mokrin, and female Orcas are generally unimpressed by Mokrin bulls, which are only slightly larger than female Orcas. Although there are a number of complications to their health, and most female hybrids rarely make it to adulthood, males seem to have a fairly reliable survival rate for unknown reasons, and they grow to become the largest dolphins of Earth or Chimere, sometimes reaching over 30 feet in length and being more than capable of battling Xanatel on their own. As on Earth, Orsonus has had a substantial impact on the cultures of Chimere. Depending on the species and culture, they are revered as cunning hunters, ruthless sea monsters, or gentle giants. No species of Orsonus hunts humans, but one can appreciate a sense of apprehension around a dolphin launching a human-sized creature 50 feet or more into the air. Although many people regard Orsonus as formidable hunters, none revere their killing prowess to the same level as the Wakinat, or Blackfish Cult, of the Western Kalin. Wakinat is an order of warriors who endure intense mental and physical training, mastering not only their bodies, but excelling in the weapons and tactics of many other cultures. If they prove themselves to an established member of the order, they undertake extensive body modification and come out with a number of physical traits meant to honor the sea wolf, or common blackfish. It is believed that this animal, being a symbol of the order, is because they hunt and kill other dolphins. Due in part to their long lives, Chimerians generally consider killing opponents to be highly taboo, especially if they have surrendered, and it is typical for warfare in Chimere to have minimal casualties. Victory is more about taking resources or defending territory than killing your opponents. To the Wakanat, there is no shame in killing dolphins. This makes the Wakanat extremely dangerous opponents, and they have a notorious reputation. Stories of them eating other Chimerans are exaggerations, but they seem to revel in the notoriety, making no effort to amend this misconception. Groups of Wakanat mercenaries are highly sought after by private enterprises, but they aren't found in the ranks of any national armies. Although Orsonus is a very recent addition to the cast of Chimere, they have very quickly established themselves as a formidable and iconic presence in the marine ecosystems of the known world and beyond. My next anthology, which will be released later this year, features short stories and novellas all with aquatic settings. One of the stories, Tempered in Ash and Blood, will follow Goliath, a Mokrin orca hybrid. After a volcano separates him and his two young cousins from the pod, Goliath must keep the calves safe in unfamiliar waters, hunting new game, and fighting off threats both strange and disturbingly familiar. Thank you so much to David for sponsoring this episode. Cheers to my patrons for their continued support. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you all for watching, and please have a fantastic day. Cheers, folks!